As a way of getting us started, we're going to get into the Word in just a second, but I want to mention something else. I have a book here uh, that I wanted to get into the hands of everyone in our church, and so I want to give this to you uh, as, a, as a gift from our church, but it's sort of a, a gift from me to you, and it's also a gift from me to the next pastor. So some of you are newer here and you may not realize this, but Anchor Church is in a bit of a transition where uh, my wife and I have started the church. Uh, We kind of started about 13 years ago in our living room, just making disciples, having friends over, neighbors over, and uh, through people that we exercised with and, and other various places, but we were building community there. And then Uh, also had the sense that God was calling us to plant a church. We waited and we were sent by a local church. And so after a few years of just faithfully serving the Lord there in that local church, they affirmed us and sent us to plant. And so we did that that work of starting the church. And uh, I thought that I might say forever, you know, just stay here and do this. Uh, And, you know, there's something interesting about that. Uh, In most countries, when you go to do missionary work, like let's say that I was going to Colombia to start a church, okay? If there's a Colombia, here. Let's say I was going to Brazil. I think I might actually have a couple of Brazilian friends that might be here. But let's say I'm going to another country and I'm going to start a church over there. Then what would happen typically is that after the groundbreaking work of sharing the gospel, you don't just go plant churches. You go plant the gospel in the hearts of men and women, boys and girls. And as you preach the gospel, the good news of Jesus, and as it takes root in the hearts of people around, them, around you, then you form what looks like a local church, a body of believers who are gathering together regularly. They are serving and, uh, the city. They are serving one another. Uh, there's, a, there's a fellowship growing, a church that's growing. And then as you make those disciples, what we learn in the, in the missionary journey that Paul takes, there's, there's at least three missionary journeys that Paul the Apostle takes in the book of Acts. And what we learn is that uh, each of those times they uh, establish a church and then they establish uh, leaders, they raise up leaders, and then there's a final step in church planting. Now, if we were, again, anywhere else but maybe here, say Colombia, Brazil, you know, somewhere else like that, or, or maybe in China or somewhere else, if my wife and I had started the church, we would, within a matter of maybe three to five to seven years, we would have found an indigenous pastor, raised him up, and then handed the ministry over to him, established the church fully, and then we would depart and then go on to whatever God was calling us to do next. The issue is that in America, I'm indigenous. So I just get to stay unless God makes it clear, hey, son, I called you to be a missionary. I wanted you to plant this church. And, uh, and some church planters get to stay 30 years. Some get kicked out after one year. I've seen it both ways. But we've been able to be here, be faithfully serving for at least 13 years now because we'll celebrate 11 years in September. And so God's been faithful to us, but also clear with us that he's calling us to move on. So in that transition, I thought that I would do a sermon series that lets you guys really have it to really know what you... No, I'm just kidding. Uh, But I did actually think, you know, what would be good is uh, to maybe prep the church for how to manage their expectations with a pastor. Not because I've been overrun or abused or neglected or abandoned, nothing like that. uh, But because I think it would be good for us as a church to manage our expectations with an incoming pastor. And then I think it would also do that incoming pastor a huge service if we could remember the title of this book, and if we had read it together. So that's what we're going to do. The book is called Pastors Are People Too. And I partly want you to read it so you'll feel sorry for me. (laughs) And I also partly want you to read it so you'll be prepped for the next guy when he comes to lead the church. And so we're, uh, we're, we're actually wanting to give one copy to each family. That was a long introduction for saying, I want you to read this book. One copy per family or household. So maybe you're you know, single or whatever, one for you. Uh, But if you're a family or whatever, I'd like to give at least one copy per household. And I want you to read through this book. I'd like for you to have a goal of reading through this book um, by uh, by the end of September. And so I want to encourage you to do that. You guys think you could do it? Well, um, I think it's good. So I want you to read it. This book, the reason that we chose this book too, though, is because Like I said, I think it would help us to manage our expectations about a pastor. It would help us to understand what the role of pastoring is, but then also all that a pastor does and all the weight that he carries as he pastors. And I think it would give us a real graciousness toward our pastors. But I have to admit that this, uh, this, you know, this church has been a church that has not been 
high maintenance. It has not been, uh, you know, all day long, plus every night of counseling, plus a lot of crisis care and a lot of hospital visits and things like that. There just really hasn't been that much. So what I guess I'm saying is uh, it hasn't been a difficult church to pastor. In fact, uh, even when there has been, you know, issues or counseling needs or care needs or anything like that, I've, I've just always been met with, with love, open arms. There's always been what feels like a real partnership here. And so there's, there's a part of me that wants this book not as a corrective it, there's nothing I see that's really deficient, but more as a supplement to us. Let's continue to love our pastors. You guys have loved me and, and loved my wife so well. And my hope is that the church would continue to love and embrace their pastor and their pastors uh, and that their pastors would feel the joy of serving the Lord and serving the church by how well the church takes care of them. So that's my prayer. I know I've got probably another month or two or three before we actually make the handoff, but that's why we wanted you to have this book to give you at least a month or two or three to read it and kind of prep your heart. So I think that's, that's about it. So as a, as a way of letting you know where we're at in the search team, we actually had a members meeting just a few weeks ago and we actually shared with the members meeting that the search team uh, had been taking uh, two guys through uh, multiple rounds of interviews. So the search team and I collaborated, but our, our, we developed an inter interview process that was four stages. And so there'd be four interviews and we had uh, about four guys uh, at the beginning of this or somewhere around the beginning and we were able to sort of move two guys, uh, hold two guys off and move two guys that we felt like were qualified potential for candidates and we actually moved them through round one, round two, and then round three. They both were so wonderful. We, they made it all the way through round three and we, uh, we thought at one point uh, what it would be like to hire maybe both of them, but we couldn't do that and so we couldn't take both guys to the hiring table, but we began as a search team to, to pray. We even took time to fast and identified that we would take one of them through into the, the last round of, of uh, interviews. And so that actually means that we're, we're headed into this last round of interviews. In the next couple of weeks, we'll do our final interview. And uh, if that goes well, then we'll have him come and speak. And if that goes well, then we'll actually make an offer. And then uh, we would try to determine you know, the time frame and timeline. So we will keep you posted. I'm sharing information with you that you would have gotten at our members meeting, but I wanted the church to know what we had shared with our members. And if you have any questions about that, we actually have an email address for you to reach out to. It's search for pastor search, search at anchorchurchonline.org. Or you can just reach out to me or Melanie, our administrator, Melanie Rivera, and we would point you in the right direction for who to contact if you had any questions or just were curious about the whole process. Is that it? That's a lot of introduction, uh, a lot of comments and things like that. But I want you to be encouraged that God really is working. I feel encouraged. I think there's been a, a few messages where maybe you could sense from me that, that uh, I might be grieving and I am and I have been. I think over the last year or so, I've probably gone through the full cycle of grief and I wanna lead our church through that as well. So there's been you know, all those stages of grief where it starts with maybe some sadness and then maybe some anger and then maybe some negotiation. And then I think it finally you know, rounds out with some acceptance. And I've just been able to get through that and really see that God is, is at work in my life and in my family's life. God is at work in the church. And I believe that God will provide for us. For me, for you, for us. Do you believe that too? Yeah. I really do believe that. And I think going through this transition together and me being as transparent as I can be with you about uh, all that we're, I'm dealing with and thinking through, I hope is a help to us as we all work through this together. We'll all have uh, sort of a, a, you know, a baseline or, or I should say a point of time where we can go back to in our mind and say, you know, there was that that, that time in our lives where we as a church went through transition, there were some things in my life I was considering and God really used that. And that's my hope for us too, that through this, we will all learn that God will provide for us. Even when we take steps of faith that we're not sure how God will provide for us, but we can trust that God will provide for us. And that's, I think, the beauty of, of, of journeying by faith is that as we walk every step, and there are some days where it is every step is an act of faith. Every step is a step of trust saying, I don't know, but I'm gonna trust you. I can't see, but I'm gonna trust you. There have even been uh, short seasons where, it's, where for me, it's I, can't, I don't hear anything. And yet I'm gonna keep tracking with what I last heard. And that is the journey of faith. So faith isn't some religious thing. Faith uh, at its core simply means trust. 
the, the journey of walking by faith is the journey of learning to trust God. When you can't see, you can't hear, uh, you know, you just continue to follow. So that's what we've been learning. That's what I want us to learn. Now, as we get into the sermon today, there's a couple of things I want for us. T- today's message is really going to play off of that idea of just walking in faith and trusting God. I want that for us. But what I want for us is that we would do this wholeheartedly, that is without reservation, and go all in on what God is calling us to do, whatever he's calling us to do. So what that means for me is that whether God might be calling you to change jobs or he might be calling you uh, to maybe move from one neighborhood to another, he might be asking you to retire, it might be time for that and you're not sure what to do, he could be calling you uh, into, you know, any number of, he could be calling you into something, uh, a new relationship or a friendship that you're hesitant to be transparent with. Uh, maybe you should be, maybe you shouldn't be. I'm not saying, uh, you know, go all in for everybody with everything. But what I am saying is, you know, listen to the Lord, trust the Lord, and he might be leading you into some change. And so as we do that, I want us to do that wholeheartedly. So let's look at a passage together and let's begin our message today. So if you would turn with me over to Second Kings, we're going to be in 2 Kings, and I want to read a story. It's, a, uh, it's an account of this King Jehoash. Uh, some versions will say Joash. And Joash uh, is a different king than the Joash earlier, which is, I think, his grandpa or great-grandpa. So this is a different Joash. I'm going to call him, as the NLT does, Jehoash. And I want you to actually read this with me so that we can, can begin to get a sense of what it looks like to follow the Lord. When Elisha was in his last illness, this is verse 14 of 2 Kings 13. 2 Kings chapter 13, verse 14. When Elisha was in his last illness, that mean, this means that the prophet Elisha is about to die. King Jehoash of Israel visited him and wept over him. My father, my father, I see the chariots and charioteers of Israel, he cried. Elisha told him, get a bow. And some arrows. And the king did as he was told. And Elisha told him, Put your hand on the bow. And Elisha laid his own hands on the king's hands. Then he commanded, Open that eastern window. And he opened it. And he said, Shoot. So he shot an arrow. Elisha proclaimed, This is the prophet of the Lord, says, This is the Lord's arrow, an arrow of victory over Aram. Now they were at battle with Aram, this other nation. And so he says, This arrow is the Lord's arrow. It signifies victory over the enemy for you will completely conquer the Arameans at Aphek. Now I wanna stop there for just a second because what we get into the, a a glimpse here into this story is that here is Jehoash coming to Elisha. Uh, Do you ever get Elisha and Elijah mixed up? Well, so he comes to Elisha and he says to Elisha the very words that Elisha said to Elijah when it was time for Elijah to, to be taken up into the heavens. So there was, this is a long way of you know, explaining all this. So you'll just have to do a little bit of study here, but I'll do a little bit of explanation too. Elijah was a prophet of God who was prophesying to the kings and to the nation way back thousands of years ago. But Elijah was prophesying and actually doing God's work. And he was a, a, a wonderful, well-known, uh, well-established prophet, still revered, you know, to this day, just almost no one can compare to him. So Elijah was an incredible prophet and Elisha was his, uh, he was his follower, his disciple. He was actually his apprentice. And so Elisha is following Elijah, finds out that Elijah is going to be taken away, taken away into heaven. This will be sort of his last day on earth, his last season here. And so Elisha says, I'm gonna follow you. And, and what happens is Elijah says, if you see me, when, when the Lord takes me away and if you catch my jacket, you know, if you catch my cloak, um, then you can, you can have this double portion of my, of my power, of my ability. I will give you the double blessing, the double portion. So Elisha says, I want a double portion of what God has given you. So then when Elijah is taken up into heaven, Elisha actually does see it. He is there, he's faithful, he's there, he's present. And he says to Elijah, as he's being taken away, my Lord, my Lord, I see the chariots and the horsemen uh, of Israel. I see the chariots and I see the horsemen. So what happens is Elijah, Elisha is actually saying, I'm here, I see it, I want the blessing, I'm taking it. So when what happens here is... Uh, when Elisha now, the second prophet, when he's on his deathbed, 
Here comes the king into Elisha and says, says the very same thing. So by this point, what the story of how the transaction took place in leadership from Elijah to Elisha was probably a legend at this point. It was well known, I'm sure, in the country. I'm sure the story had been repeated over and over again. And so uh, the king knows this and comes in and says to Elisha, my Lord, my Lord, I see the chariots and the horsemen. This would be a nod to I'm here I know that you're passing away. I'm asking for a portion. I'm asking for a blessing in this last day. And so this is exactly what it appears that Elisha is doing for him. Elisha says, okay, I know we're at battle with uh, Aram and I know that we actually have uh, you know, a, a battle to face and I know that you're in peril and I know that this was gonna be difficult for you and I know that what the king is asking, this is all Elisha, you know, I'm imagining him to say, I know that what the king wants is my blessing so that he will overcome the enemy and so that the blessing of God will remain on Israel so that the kingdom isn't taken away or that the kingdom isn't destroyed. And so he wants this blessing, wants to give it to him. So Elisha says, okay, grab the bow and the arrows and I want you to open up that window and I want you to shoot the arrow out of that eastern window in the direction of your enemy. This would be something that I think at times is a... a, a statement of of aggression, a statement of intent to go to war. You would take a javelin or something and throw it toward the enemy. You might take arrows and you might throw, uh, you know, shoot one over in the direction of the enemy. But he says to him, take an arrow and shoot it out that eastern window. So at this point, they're so afraid that the windows seem to be boarded up. So he has to open up the window and he, he, he gets ready to shoot. And then Elisha puts his hand on him and gives him his blessing. And uh, in a way says that uh, God is with you. Now shoot this arrow. So I want you to think, here's, here's someone who says, I want the blessings of God. And then here he receives the affirmation from Elisha with, a, with his hands on his hands, meaning I receive the blessings of God and what I put my hand to will be victorious. So he does, he pulls the arrow back, shoots it. And then Elisha says to him, this arrow is, the, is uh, a sign or is the victory that God is giving you. It's the arrow of the Lord. You will be victorious over them. So go to battle with them, go and don't be afraid. I think what, I, what I'm trying to say is when we receive uh, the, the promise of God that God will be with us and, and sometimes when it's, when it's specific, like the way Elisha was with, king, with the king, that, that God will uh, bless you, he will be with you, he will, you will overcome your enemies in this case, then that should fill us with courage. It should fill us with, uh, with, with even real passion, with, with what I would call wholehearted devotion to God. Meaning when we know what God has promised us and when we receive that promise from God and when we know that God is with us, that um, should actually prompt us to go all in for what God is calling us to do. I think so far we're there, everyone's tracking. But when, 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 we, when we read this passage, what we find though is that the king really is only half-hearted and only partly interested in the blessing and mostly interested in, self, in self-preservation. And so I think one of the questions I might ask and have asked myself is, Lord, when I come to you and I ask you for your presence and I ask you for your blessing and for your provision and for your protection, I think it's worth at least asking once, but asking yourself from time to time, why? God, what is your intention with my life? What do you desire to see? What are your promises to me? and cling to those and then give everything you've got to what God is calling you to do. And that's what I think would be uh, fitting in this situation, but I want you to see there's a little bit of a difference here when it comes to the king. And here's where you'll see kind of what I was laying down in verse 18. After he shoots this arrow of victory over Aram, he says, uh, Elisha says to the king, King Jehoash, now pick up those other arrows and strike them against the ground. So the king picked them up and he struck the ground three times. But the man of God was angry with him. You should have struck the ground five or six times. Where's the passion? Where's, where, where's the grit? Where's the determination? Where's the wholehearted devotion? Where's the faith that God will do and overcome uh, the enemy like he said he would do? Where's the, where's the, where, where's the, you know, the hope that you have? Where's the faith? Where's the trust? Where's the commitment? 
He says, take it and hit, it on, hit, the, hit the arrows against the ground. So the king picked them up, struck it to the ground three times, and the man of God was angry and said, you should have struck the ground five or six times, he exclaimed. Then you would have beaten Aram until it was entirely destroyed. Now you will be victorious only three times. Now, there's a lot to take out of that, but I think what I want us to see as God's been challenging me, so you might be thinking, okay, what are you gonna do here with this passage? I'm just sharing with you what God's been sharing with me. Chris, I'm calling you. And as I make it clear, I haven't made every step clear, but as I make it clear, I want you to follow me with wholehearted devotion. I want you to trust me with wholehearted devotion, loyalty, fidelity, but follow me. And in following me, give me your whole heart. Be passionate for me. Be passionate for what we're doing together. Be passionate about what I'm calling you to join me in. Be passionate about that, Chris. And so that's what I am practicing. So I think there's a number of areas in our lives where we can be passionately following God and not a sort of half-hearted or self-interested in some way. So as to say, you know, like the same way with the king, shoot the arrow, it's a promise of victory. Elisha laid his hands on his hands. There's the promise of God's presence, the promise of victory, and all of that is, is there entangled in this story. And then when he says, now take those other arrows and strike them against the ground. And he goes, one, two, three. And then just kind of looks at him, you know, and they make eye contact. And Elisha's like, that's it, bro? I mean, if one of our children were ill, now this is before 1950, you know, before uh, penicillin, you know, uh, penicillin's ruined, I think, you know, our prayer lives in some ways. You would not have stopped at three prayers. You never would have done it. You'd have prayed day and night. If you were in uh, some other type of crisis, a relational or financial or, or some other maybe transition like we're talking about, where you're going from one job to another, or maybe it's a move, or maybe it's going into the military, coming out of the military. Maybe it's going from elementary school to middle school. Uh, some of you are in here. Maybe it's going from middle school to high school, high school to college, college to wherever, or maybe you're not even going to college. You're going to trade school, something like that. I'm trying to be, you know, super PR right now. So... Maybe, maybe you're just transitioning in some way. But as we transition, I think there's a moment here for us to go all in and trust the Lord, follow him wholeheartedly into what he's calling us to do. So I want, I want to invite you into that as I think about that. So the Lord's been telling me that. Chris, I want you to pray I want you to follow me. I don't want you to stop at one or two prayers when it comes to something that you need. I don't want you to stop at one or two prayers. I don't want it to have to be a crisis for you to be praying to me three or four times or five or six times. I want wholehearted passion and devotion. I want relationship with you. And so that's where I think God's been challenging me and encouraging me. And even when it comes to what, what might be open doors in my life, the, the opportunities where God's opening doors for me to step into what, he's, what, what, might be, what might be his will for my life. I'm wanting to do this wholeheartedly and not half-heartedly, not sort of hesitating. The, the only, the only uh, you know, fallback I have is that I have friends who I can talk to who might hold me accountable. I have friends I can talk to who might give me words of wisdom and words of advice. I have the scriptures that I'm reading. I always have my wife who, who's great to encourage me and, uh, and to keep you know, my feet on the ground. I can get up into the, into the clouds sometimes with all of my dreams and ideas. So I do have some protection around me. It's not like just do whatever you want to do. But as the Lord opens up doors, I don't want us to be hesitating like, ah, oh, I'm not sure. You know, so some of you might be thinking about a, a job transition or maybe it's like a job uh, opening and you're afraid of taking that job opening because, well, you're not sure you're qualified or you're not really sure what it would mean for your family or you're not sure. But there's this sense you have that you should take it and you've talked to a couple of friends and you've gotten some good advice and you've prayed about it more than three times and you're actually all in on this saying, okay, I'm gonna do it. And so then because you've got confidence in the Lord and you're not afraid of the outcome and you're not being operating out of uh, you know, shame or insecurity or doubt, um, and you step out and you apply for the job and whether you get it or not, you've actually, you've taken a step of faith. They're saying, okay, Lord, I'm just gonna trust you with this. That's an example of what I'm saying. When the opportunities open up, the Lord is saying, just go in and step into that. And I think what happens for us sometimes is that we, we might you know, hesitate out of fear 
We might hesitate out of self-interest. I might hesitate out of insecurity, doubt, doubt that God will provide, doubt that things will work out the way I'd like for them to work out. And uh, I'm being challenged by this passage to take those steps of faith. And, and as I do that, I'm encouraging you to do the same thing. There was another morning I had, this wasn't all in the same morning, but there was another morning shortly after reading that and being encouraged by God that um, I was in Ezekiel. Uh, and that's you know, not the best place to be reading your Bible when you're looking for encouragement. But um, I, did, I did sort of you know, happen to be in Ezekiel. And so I'm just sort of reading that. And I want you to read with me Ezekiel 43, 12. So the people that disobeyed God, God's putting everything back in order using the, a new prophet. It's another person's name is Ezekiel. So we had Elijah, Elisha, and then Ezekiel. So you guys are getting a full Bible lesson this morning. But Ezekiel in chapter 43, God's actually giving him instructions for how to set things in order. And he says that that what happened before was that they didn't set things in order. They didn't care or pay attention. There wasn't wholehearted devotion to me. And so put things in order, Ezekiel. And by the way, this is... The, the, if I could drill the whole law down into this one thing, it would be this one precept, this one principle. Now, wouldn't you be interested to know in the Old Testament what God deems to be uh, the summation of all of his laws and all of his, uh, all of his decrees? Wouldn't you like to know what that is? I would. So let's read it together. Ezekiel 43, verse 12. This is the law of the temple. Uh, excuse me. Now, this is uh, Ezekiel 43, 12. Okay, it looks like I'm gonna have to get over there. I think that this is, uh, make sure that I gave the uh, reference right. 43, 12. Okay, this is it. And this is the basic law of the temple, absolute holiness. The entire top of the mountain where the temple is built is holy. Yes, this is the basic law of the temple. So of all the laws, here's the basic law. This is everything summarized in this one thing. Holiness, absolute holiness. In 13 years of ministering and preaching and teaching, I think that one of the main themes of my teaching has been absolute holiness. Now, I've also spent significant amounts of time explaining to you that for me, holiness is, is wholehearted devotion to God. It's being set apart unto God. It's being fully dedicated. They would take the instruments of the temple and they would dedicate them to God. In other words, they were devoted for the use of God. They were devoted to God to be kept there, safe by God, safe and protected by the people, honored as being devoted to the Lord. That's how we should view ourselves, with wholehearted Devotion, absolute, wholehearted, holiness, devotion to God. When I think about absolute holiness, though, I wasn't taken aback like, oh, no, I have all these sins. You know, when we think about holiness, it's almost like, okay, then I have to, uh, you know, as I make this transition and as we make this transition, as we go through things in life, the ups and downs, I better not make a mistake because the basic principle of the entire law is absolute holiness. And to, I think, religious people who really haven't understood the heart of, of, of God and the, the, the understanding of God's desire for his people, his love and his passionate pursuit of his people, uh, I think that they might misunderstand this to say that you better not make any mistakes or I will be frustrated with you. That's what I think some of us hear when we read that verse. The basic law of the temple is absolute holiness. And you hear it almost with overtones of like, you know, stern father or, or stern and critical mother, right? I'm going, I'm gonna go to work today. You're, it's summertime and you got the kids at the house. I'm going to work. I'll be gone for three hours. I expect absolute holiness. <laughs> when I get back, I expect cleanliness, something like that. You know, I expect that this will happen and I, and, I, and I refuse to accept anything less than this. And so what I want to do is to pull us away, draw us out of that and to understand what joy there is in a statement like this. The basic principle of the entire law 
is just wholehearted devotion to me. If you guys were devoted to me, you would have listened to my words. If you guys were devoted to me, you would have sought my counsel and you would have overcome your enemies. If you had listened to me, then you would have been passionate when I said, I'm with you, I will never leave you. And you would have said, okay, then I'm not gonna hesitate. I'll just go right into what you're calling me to do. If you were wholeheartedly devoted to me, and maybe not listening to other voices or not, not even listening to my own voice, my own worry uh, just rattling off in my, my head. If you were listening to me and clearing out every other voice and listening to me, absolute devotion to me, then everything in the temple would be right. Everything in your home would be right. Now, you, you know, we'd go through uh, sickness. I don't mean like health and wealth and all of this. But what I do mean, though, is that when we are wholeheartedly devoted to God, then we can sing the song we just sang, you're never going to let me down. I admit there have been seasons in my life where if I'd walked into a church and they had sang a song that said, you're never going to let me down. I just did it, you know, in cadence, but I wasn't going to sing it. Don't even try. I'm not going to sing. God called me to preach and not to sing. So <clears throat> I'll let, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll do it. Okay, no, I'm not going to do it. So, um, so what, when, when, when we're walking in absolute holiness, there's real, there's real joy there. I, I'm th- I think of passion. I think of love. And, and, uh, and I think of this, this idea here uh, uh, of just, you know, singing this song, you're never going to let me down. And the only way that that's true is in the context of just wholehearted devotion, absolute holiness. I am devoted to you, God. I'm not without errors. I'm not without sin. I'm not without fault. I'm not without mistakes, but I am devoted to you, Lord. And so in that context, I think what we find is the real pleasure of God. In that context, I think we find uh, all that he intends for us to experience. So for me, the Lord was saying, Chris, I'm calling you uh, out of, you know, being a pastor, but just so you don't, you know, mistake what's happening here. And I want to share this with you. This is really important. God is not calling me out of ministry. It has been my job for 13 years now to equip you to do the work of the ministry. It is the pastor's plural job, their job to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. Do you see that? And so then I am not leaving the ministry. I am stepping into the ministry. And that's how we need to see it. That's how you need to see it. You are in the ministry. And what God desires from you is wholehearted devotion to him. Passionate pursuit of what God is calling you to do. And when we do this, I think what we find, you know, I think there are people in the Bible who have done this, you know, and they, they uh, as they go through this, they, they experience, you know, opposition. Nehemiah, where my wife is reading, uh, we're, you know, she's reading Ezra and then Nehemiah, we've been talking about it. She's been encouraging me so much with this. But in Ezra and Nehemiah, they go to do what God's calling them to do. And they even wholeheartedly doing it, you know, with real passionate pursuit of God in this. And they meet so much opposition. And even Jesus when Jesus is saying to his disciples, I'm going to go to the cross, I'm going to die, I'll be buried, and then I'll, be, I'll rise again. They still, they, he, he told them three times that he was go- going to die, and they still didn't get it, they still didn't understand. And even Peter at one point says, that'll never happen to you. That's not going to happen. There's opposition. There's always going to be opposition. And I think it's important for us to realize that. We need friends we can trust that we can talk to, that we can bounce things off of. And we need a a series of friends so that we get collective wisdom here. One will say, don't take that job. Another will say, man, you ought to take that job. And you got to weigh that out. And you need the spirit and you need the scriptures. You know, you need that kind of counsel and advice as you step forward into what God has for you. But there will always be opposition. You know, one of the things that I'm, I'm hesitant of is that as I think about what's next for me and the opportunities I'm stepping into, uh, I think that I've had, uh, as I've shared it with a few people, I've even had uh, one or two people say, why can't you just be content? Back, back, back. I'm talking like maybe a year ago, you know, thinking through, man, I think God's stirring in my heart. I'm not sure. You know, I just want to pray about this. Well, why can't you just be content? What do we need to do? Is there a change? Is there something we need to do? Can't we just keep you? And it's like, no, I, well, 
maybe let's pray, you know, let's, let's think about it. Let's pray, let's fast. But there are always people who misunderstand what God's calling you to do. They just won't understand it. You have to take a step of faith when it becomes clear that that's what God's calling you to do, even in face of opposition. Now, I also had to get my own counsel. I went and saw a mentor and I have a group of pastors that I actually weigh everything against and, and they hold me accountable, but they care for me. So I got advice and I was in the scriptures and, and the Lord began to make things clear that this was the step in the journey I was supposed to take, but that wasn't without opposition. It'll be the same for us. We follow the Lord regardless of what comes against us because our absolute devotion is to him and to what he's calling us to do. And you know, it really doesn't matter when you know and when it's clear and when you've got some people you trust who can affirm you and the spirit seems to say go and the scriptures seem to be clear, then you just go and it doesn't matter what anyone else says or does. That's the kind of confidence we need to have in him. Wouldn't you like to have that kind of confidence? I know I would. And I know that that's what the Lord's calling us to do as a church, as a family, but even as individuals, to be listening to his voice, to be so wholeheartedly devoted to him that when it becomes clear, and only then, but when it becomes clear, then we take a full step of faith, following him into whatever he has for us, regardless of how the chips fall. That's just the way it goes. And I'm encouraging you to do that. That's what I've been doing. That's what I'm working on. That's where our family is. That's where the church is. We're, we're working through this transition. And I got to tell you, you know, I don't, I don't know how to uh, maybe make, make, uh, help you understand the best way what that feels like for me. But some of you have actually uh, had a child that you've handed off in, in marriage, you know, like a daughter. Um, and someday I will go down that road. But what this feels like at times for me, and this is sort of the trust that I'm just having to release everything to the Lord is almost like here's Anchor Church. Here's, you know, this thing I've raised, you know. She's, a, she's you know, not super rebellious, but sometimes a little bit, <laughs> a little bit, you know, whatever. So here's, here's this. And then it's like, you know, here's the other pastor. And, um, you know, in case he ever hears the sermon, I should say, I just love everybody and I, I have no uh, qualms or issues. But, but it does have that, that feeling of like, oh man, and I'm just having to release all of that to the Lord. I, I know this guy, I think I like this guy, I like all the guys, but you know, as we get closer and closer to the end of the line here, I, I, I've, I, we've vetted, we've prayed, um, the search team seems to affirm and we're moving in faith and each step is, you know, closer and closer. And I'm just thinking, okay, just imagine you're handing your daughter off to this guy and you think, okay, I like this guy, but what if in three years, you know, they're, they're living in my house again <laughs> or, or something goes wrong. Maybe he goes sideways, you know? So then I'm thinking, oh man, I don't really know this guy. But then I'm also thinking, you know, well, it's my daughter too. And I know she's got a couple of hangups. And so I kind of feel sorry for both of them, you know, a little bit. <laughs> uh, I, should, I, I should stick to preaching. Now I'm starting to tell jokes, but... but but I want you to know, hey, there's real angst for me. There has been, but there's also real joy and devotion to God. I just believe he's gonna take care of me. I do believe he's asked me to take this step of faith to follow him. And in doing so, I really don't need to be, don't want to be afraid of what's gonna happen. He's called me and I can trust him to take care of all of us along the way. You can too. That's the confidence that I have. That's like, uh, the, we were just listening to something and, and now I'm, it, it escapes my memory, but it's like David and Goliath where, where uh, David has been annoyed. Oh, it was last week. It was, uh, it, or two weeks ago when Fretwell was preaching. I, I thought about that sermon for a, a minute after that. And I really enjoyed the message. And, and I really loved the point where, where he drew out that, that once David was convinced because he was anointed to be the king, once he was convinced that God would make good on his promise, then he really was, frankly, invincible until he was king. And if it hadn't happened yet, then he probably wasn't going to die because God had made a promise he was going to be king. So when he gets in and he faces Goliath, part of why he's not afraid is because of his experience with the lion and the bear and whatnot. The other part that I think uh, Dr. Fretwell drew, drew out for us a couple weeks ago that really has ministered to me is he also wasn't afraid because he remembered the promise that someday I'm gonna be king and I'm not king yet, so I'm not gonna die. So I'll just go out and fight this dude that's two times my height. That's faith. 
God has promised that he will be with us, that he will walk with us, that he will care for us. And in the, in the context of that promise, we can step in faith with wholehearted devotion to God. So I have more to say about this and I think I'll pick it back up again next week, but I wanna, I wanna push us into wholehearted devotion to God and examples of that. But for now, I really want us to be challenged and even open ourselves up to God and just say, okay, Lord, as you call me into what's next, <clears throat> and as I consider wholehearted devotion, absolute holiness to you in that, where might I be lacking passion? Where might I be lacking passion because of self-interest or because of fear, because of insecurity or doubt? But where might I be lacking passion in following you, Lord? There's any number of areas. We might not be fighting our sin the way we should be fighting sin in our lives. We might just be fine to be treating our wife that way. You might just be fine to be treating your kids that way. You might just be fine to be treating your employees that way. But where might God say, hey, pick up those arrows and I want you to strike the ground and us to say, I'm done with this and I never wanna see it again. And I wanna fight this and I wanna be wholeheartedly devoted to God for the rest of my life. Where might he be encouraging you, challenging you not to give up on prayer for that person or for that thing, whatever it is? Where is he encouraging you to be passionately following him in this? And to me, as I finish this message, that would be the essence of this idea of absolute holiness. It's not just what we're supposed to avoid, like what we shouldn't be doing anymore. Like I, admit, I demand absolute holiness, so stop doing all the bad things. I think that's a part of the conversation, but I think when I th think of it and the way I want you to perceive it is God calling us uh, to pursue him above all else. Above all other loves, we love him the most. Above all other things we are afraid of, we fear him the most. And in that context, I think we'll be stepping in more and more faith, trust, and more and more courage as God makes it clear what's next for us. So will you join me in that? That's my prayer, wholehearted devotion for every single person at Anchor Church with no fear, but confidence in him as he calls us out to follow him and that we would encourage each other in this journey. Let's pray. Lord, help us today. There's quite a number of other things that we could share. And actually, I think because there's so many good and mature believers here in our church, I, I would just be uh, encouraged to, to know that they had met people, uh, you know, met each other at coffee shops and living rooms and met each other for dinner and that the discussion about wholehearted devotion to God, the discussion about uh, this, this story of King uh, Jehoash, which, uh, you know, ha has some, some nuance there. I, I, my, my delight would be, Holy Spirit, that you would continue this conversation in the hearts of, of Anchor Church. And that we would be prompted to consider what it would look like to, to live with absolute holiness, which is the basic principle, which is absolute and wholehearted devotion to you, which the New Testament simply calls love. Love. God, give us a love for you. Give us a passion for you. Give us a love for you so great that it overshadows our love of every other thing. And so then everything can fall into its rightful place in our life. So God, please minister to us today. Encourage us today. Call us out. Challenge us where we need to be challenged, but motivate us with great joy and gratitude for the fact that you're inviting us into your presence, inviting us to be wholeheartedly devoted to you. And my prayer, God, is that you would protect us that you would provide for us, that you'd go before us, that you'd answer our prayers, that you'd heal us when we need healing and restore us where we need restoring, that you'd forgive us where we need forgiving, Lord. And that being fortified and established in you, <clears throat> you would empower us for what you're calling us to do, God. And I pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen.